All right, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Bruce Mazza from Tate, and uh, we're really pleased to have you here and helping us um, and hopefully helping you with some good facilitation and discussion about what's happening in the mining industry and how that drives and uh, gives shape to the ICT trends, what's really going to be valuable um, in this time of tremendous change for mining organizations as they look to make investments. And um, we're uh, really glad you're here because you represent the industry, um, both in terms of uh, technology industry, uh, services, and of course, the experts from the mining organization. So thanks for coming. Um, just a little bit of the logistics. Uh, we'll just do a quick round of introduction. Um, and then we'll go into some brief uh, discussion about what's happening in the industry and trends. And then we're going to hit some particular topics in depth. But this is really about a conversation. Um, we have a few slides up here, but this is not a uh, presentation. This is definitely not a vendor discussion or presentation. This is really about the industry. And this is about um, your uh, chance to learn and our chance to learn collectively uh, in this room. So um, we'll start with a, a brief round of introductions. Um, I'm uh, in charge of our solutions practice at Tate Communications. Um, I work out of the Christchurch office. I've been there for a couple of years. Uh, previous to that, I had about 20 years in the communications industry at various different uh, organizations uh, and supporting a number of different industries, including uh, finance, emergency communications, uh, industrial technology and utilities communications, and uh, now really focused on putting together new solutions um, based on a, f a number of different forms of wireless communications uh, at Tate. And I'll hand it over to Mike. Uh, Mike Mulvey. Um, it seems that you have to be uh, a Mike to be in this room. We've got four of us, I think. Michaels or Mike, so very popular name. Um, I run the uh, sales team across Asia Pacific, so um, have, a, have a vested interest in understanding your business and um, and uh, being able to be relevant to your business is, is my driver. Um, my background is uh, making wine in New Zealand for the previous 10 years. I've only been with Tate a couple of years. I, I took a bit of a hiatus up to a cave in central Otago where I hid out for about 10 years and made wine. That was a, a great thing to do. And prior to that, I was in uh, the telecommunications industry all, all my life prior to that. Um, got uh, led astray by an Aussie uh, woman and uh, ended up living over here So um, and lo loving it. <coughs> Alan. So, Alan Ball from Tate. Um, I've recently joined Tate as their National Channel Sales Manager. So, yeah, I've been at Tate for about eight weeks now, so still relatively new to the business. I've been in the industry for probably about four and a half years uh, now. Um, prior to that, I worked in IT for Sun Microsystems for about 12 years in various roles. So, their sales operations, marketing, uh, Y2K, which was interesting um, when I first joined Sun, but uh, ultimately I've uh, been in various roles through uh, Vendorland and you're just really keen to understand the dialogue today, some of the, the key market or key drivers in minerals and energy, and ultimately yeah, that's all the information I have and, and take forward. So thank you for your time. Good, Steve. Good morning, um, I'm Steve Blackwell from MindSite Technology. Um, I'm familiar with MindSite. We're a locally owned global provider of mining technologies. Started off predominantly in the underground space and um, now obviously five offices across Australia and internationally. Um, Andrew Hall, work for Roy Hill, I'm the uh, manager of the design authority for IT, so uh, architects, enterprise architecture and stuff like that. My background is mainly around um, application kind of implementation, uh, work for Telstra, uh, CSC <coughs> and Roy Hill. And predominantly at the moment, the focus is on, you know, implementing the Roy Hill strategy, right, and achieving business outcomes. Uh, Nick Jenkins from Vision Stream, uh, civil engineer, worked uh, internationally uh, through major construction projects, and uh, now look after the Pilbara resources and mining for uh, Vision Stream. 
Michael Bruce from Vision Stream, um, CTO, run a design and central engineering group spanning across a range of uh, Vision Stream projects. Uh, personal background from originally being a development engineer and in this embedded systems to probably every telecommunic, just about every telecommunications technology from fiber electric, long haul, telecoms, remote solar, power, data centers, various types of radio and so on. Really building, building solutions and delivering solutions to Thank you. Uh, Michael Williams uh, from Rio Tinto, uh, currently working for the Office of the CIO in um, the strategy uh, telecommunications area uh, in the infrastructure space. Uh, prior to that, I've, I've been with Rio for 10 years now, which seems, um, <laughs> I don't know how 10 years has flown by so quick, but um, uh, worked in the operations project space and now in the uh, uh, strategy area, which is a, a, a <coughs> great fit for me, myself. Uh, prior to that, I was in broadcast television, so mm. I'm still trying to work out how I got in mining, but anyway. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so interesting career, but um, it's been <coughs> fairly challenging the last couple of years, with, uh, especially with the onset of all the digital um, uh, uh, LT, such, things such as LTE coming online. So, yeah, it's been, uh, been, been good. Glad to have you, thank you. Oh yeah, good morning. Tom Gurka from Cisco. I run a team of solutions architects globally, so although I'm based in Perth, my sort of remit is global. Uh, our team focuses primarily on new technologies in, into service providers, and one of them you know, that we're a big sort of full core press on is private LTE. So private LTE into a range of verticals, including mining, oil and gas, public safety, transportation, etc. I'll talk a little bit about what Cisco is providing there, but from a team perspective, um, you know, we really focus on the technology, not so much on uh, the sales. So we spend a lot of our time uh, building proof of concepts, uh, getting that up and running, working with customers, understanding the requirements, um, and you know, really understanding the end to end. So very keen to be here, listen to people. We've already had a lot of discussions with you know the, the mining and the oil and gas and public safety, but it's a, a good to, to come along and you know get another another view of what people are interested in. Great, thank you. Uh, Mike Steganer from Titan ICT Consultants. Um, been running consulting firms in Perth for about 20 years. Um, we've got an office in Brisbane and uh, in Perth. Um, we provide consulting services, general advice in ICT, anything ICT really, and, uh, and also solutions delivery and, and support as well. So whether we're building things or, or providing front end advice, we're, we're happy either way. Um, most of our work's uh, in mining, but we also do work in rail, uh, oil and gas, and, and government. Thank you. No more Michaels. Under Hamish. Hamish Hutton. I um, have a team called the Campaign and Content Team at Tate. Um, so we produce these kinds of events around the world for different industries. Um, the idea behind these types of days is to both pull a lot of knowledge out of the um, industry for our use, but also to get a share between members of the industry as well. So it's Tate's way of investing in and in creating good conversations within the markets. Mm -hmm. So um, this is probably the sixth one of these that I've done now, and um, it's continued to deliver great results. So I have a couple of fun use of day. Kevin? My name's Evan, and I am the videographer for the day. So um, my one request is kind of an the worst of this too. Uh, you all have microphones in front of you, which means even if you're not talking, it will hear you going click, 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 click. So just uh, there's a couple people who have already started then. Um, <laughs> Maybe now. Um, and uh, you know, it's not a big deal, but then when you listen on the back end on the headphones, it sounds like someone's, you know, shooting. Yeah, shooting. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, just ignore me, basically. That's the, the goal. Thanks, Evan. Yeah. All righty. So as we said, uh, this is really about sharing best practices and sharing knowledge. Um, Hamish will talk in a moment about what we've done before with these sessions uh, in other industries um, around the world and how we've used it as a way to really bring some ideas forward as a matter of education into the market. Uh, this is obviously a very dynamic market with a lot of challenges right now and also a dynamic communications industry with a lot of new technology becoming available. So it's really important that we look at how um, that intersects with the business outcomes. And I think probably the biggest 
biggest challenge uh, that we have uh, and collectively have together is figuring out what is the most important business outcomes that are going to drive your investments. They're going to be more and more selective and they're going to be um, done in a way that's really uh, thinking about the future right now in this time of challenge with the uh, commodities pricing, um, all the challenges with the workforce reductions that are happening. And so the use of technology has to be selected, but it's also a, a significant enabler. And ICT is an enabler to really help drive that efficiency and drive uh, results is something that the industry can benefit from. So we hope to play a small part in that in, in this room and trying to bring some of that forward um, and back play it back to the industry as well. Um, so you want to say a little bit more? Amy yeah, so, so basically this is pretty similar to the formula we've used around the world. We, we gather a group of um, not necessarily that many people uh, around the table. Um, so for example, last year we ran these events for public safety in uh, New Orleans, um, Lake Tahoe, Washington DC, for example, the year before that, a couple of Phoenix. Um, we've run utilities and uh, really just break into the mining space with this stuff. Um, the project that, um, that, that, that those uh, four guidebooks referred to there was um, the P25 Best Practices Project. You guys probably are slightly familiar with that term, P25, it's the US Public Safety um, Program uh, Standard. And um, so off the back of the, the round tables there, we, we ended up producing those four in our fifth guide, which work you through um, first steps to getting a P25 system, how to specify it, um, how to procure it. That's really complex when you're spending public money on it, um, how to implement it, and now we've got a new guide coming out this month on how to manage. So we just freely share the knowledge that comes back out of these events and way the way we see to be the best for the industry. And those have been hugely popular in the industry and um, been downloaded by thousands and thousands of people. So we take the time to take this knowledge and um, digest it into something. We give back to you and also share um, as sort of generic advice. I don't think that would come out of the back of this event, but after we've done two, three, maybe more of these events, then we'll probably be in a position where we start publishing some form of documentation back to the industry of what we're learning. Um, so I suppose the reason that's important for you guys is we're not here to tell you, and you're not here to know all the answers, but what you are here to do is give all your different perspectives to that discussion, and out of that, um, you know, hopefully over time we can start to form an industry consensus around things. And it's obviously great for vendors to have some form of consensus, otherwise we're all pulling in a different direction. Um, so yeah, and as you would refer to, we'll be videoing it. Um, the video's really done because it's a great way to then uh, we get them um, typed up by a, um, a person that gives us the raw material. It's a really efficient way of capturing it. Is that about very much? Yeah, during lunch we'll probably grab you guys and can interview, just ask you a few questions of the really great points we're discussing today, just to make sure that we, you know, everyone gets their point across that they think are the main But So just, um, if, we, if you don't mind, we'll grab you and just ask you a couple of questions on camera about the trends and technologies that you think are important and those sorts of things, that'd be great. Yeah. And all the transcripts and everything will be shared openly, so it's not something that uh, will go away in, in a closed box and uh, we'll have certainly an opportunity for you to look through that and make sure you're comfortable with the material and that you know exactly how we're planning to use it and that that's agreed to, so it's not something we'll um, surprise you anything with. Any questions at all? Does that make sense? Great. Alrighty, so just a little bit about the agenda. Um, we're going to hit four topics, um, starting with the first one being the focus and topic around increasing productivity within the mines, um, both around using data and voice communications. Um, we'll have some very short vendor presentations just to share a little point of view from each of the vendors and integrators that are here. Then we'll break for lunch. And then we'll hit our second topic, which will be about safety in the mines. And again, leveraging innovation to drive uh, mine safety. And then we'll have a little afternoon tea and talk about the uh, opportunity to have a different management um, of the mines, understanding how you manage today, what are some of the opportunities for going forward, and some of the drivers that will uh, look at how mine management and ICT um, and your strategies, certainly Andrew and Mike, uh, going forward, how you're looking to have uh, mine management done and how ICT supports that in the future. And then we'll do a little bit of a deep dive at the end on some of the topics, things like LTE 
as an example, uh, share a little bit about what's going on with the standards in the industry uh, around those things, and, um, and then we'll do a wrap up after that. Okay. So I wanted to start with this uh, discussion here, a set of discussion topics, and really start to facilitate around the room. That's my job today is to listen and facilitate and draw out different points of view. And um, obviously with the falling commodity prices um, today that are really driving a lot of the workforce reductions in the coal, um, that's presenting a, a number of challenges for how operations are done. But not to mention the pricing in the gold market also uh, being somewhat deflated in the last few years and uh, leveling out, uh, along with the disruptive technologies, you know, how are you going to marry these two together? Um, we also have heard very clearly from our customers that when the, when the rush was on to build and invest in new capital, there became a, a large number of projects, a large number of networks, a large number of applications that get put in place. And now that that is actually uh, in place, the question is how do you scale that complexity and try to manage it in a way to drive operational efficiency. Um, but these are a range of topics, you know, labor uh, costs, uh, workforce um, uh, regulations, compliance, safety, as well as the potential for some industry consolidation, uh, and then the high cost of downtime. I really want to hear from you which of these are key trends in your organizations or the organizations you deal with, and what are, what are the key ones that uh, might be missing from this discussion topic, and which ones are really driving the investment that you foresee in the next, you know, two to five years of technology. Anyone like to comment and share a little bit? Can I, can I jump in and say, Mike, you made a really interesting comment to me outside, which was around um, the, the kind of current situation having always been part of the plan. You always sort of forecast, and you're almost where you go and want it to be. Oh, there's, there's always a gap between, um, well, with ICT and the mining industry itself, um, you know, we're not an IT communications company, we're a mining company. So there's, there's, there is a bit of a disconnect between operational and operational requirements at that given time versus where anyone in the IT industry within mining uh, knows where they need to be in, in two to three years' time. So trying to get that business case up and running convince the powers to be to implement those sort of strategies is always difficult and trying to even come up with a cost benefit um, on efficiencies is a real problem in mining mm -hmm. because um, especially the way what being an iron ore commodity prices were pretty much we could just throw money um, at people to fix the problem until it goes away rather than actually look at the efficiency without having to throw people at a problem sort of thing so uh, I think one of the things probably missing there is that as you move technology up a scale, um, uh, you need to take into consideration people, um, change, change management of people, because mm -hmm. it actually affects you know, um, people's jobs and things like that as well. Um, and one of the trends I see uh, as well, if you look at a, a graph, I'm trying to draw it, <laughs> um, is as technology increases on your x-axis, um, you would um, want your obviously your support costs to come down as well, but I tend to see a trend going upwards um, on support rather as your technology increases as well. So uh, greenfield is easy, brownfield is very difficult to implement um, because you're trying to obviously take on board old systems that, and integrate into new systems, and you you got a budget for that increase in cost until they actually come down. But, I see sometimes those support costs remain high, they need to go higher. Um, Could, I, is long. Could I add to that, Mike, as well, is what we see is you talk about sets of disciplines of people in your mind. Um, you've got your IT corporate crowd and IT, so everyone thinks <coughs> IT is the solution, whereas this is another discipline in itself about the technology of efficiencies and gathering data and automation. Um, it's not always the IT group um, has that ability and that education to go forward with that type of technology and how to bolt it in 
from operations to win a pit, to your rail control, to the guys at the port, there it's a, it's a different discipline. Mm -hmm. And I think we're moving into those disciplines that are differing from just your traditional um, site supervisor, your mine manager, and you know, you know your IT support guy. Um, yeah. You know, this is something that's evolved out of just technology, and, and it's a self awareness across that. Yeah. Line. All Def that business as yeah. well. Definitely, I think customer engagement is the key thing. I mean, I mean, I suppose I class myself as an internal salesperson within Rio Tinto. Yeah. And if you don't have that direct customer engagement about exactly what they want to see in their work, um, uh, and a lot of times you have to work out for them mm. their own business, you have to learn mining yeah. mm -hmm. yourself um, and then put that into technology ideas and then come back to them and say, well, this is what we could do. Yeah. Um, because they don't know. They, know. they know what their job is. You know, we're talking mining engineers, surveyors, operators, whatever. Um, uh, you need to explain to them or know how their area works and then go back. So, so you yeah, can apply technology. So it's very important for you know, because you know, a lot of external guys obviously come to me, um, yeah. but they don't actually know about mining. So there's no point in selling, trying to sell something to someone if you don't know how mine, mining operations run. Yeah. Do you do you have formal change programs that you roll out so that you can get that adoption? Um, and how do you actually work with the, the staff to roll out new technology? Uh, yeah, we do. We have we do have a change management process, a formalised change management process in place uh, for that, and the scale of that change management will depend on how big that change is. Yeah. So when you start talking about technology efficiencies and things like that, at the end of the day, it's it is actually probably taking pe people out of the Pilbara. So Rio's philosophy has been um, professionals. Are more now Perth based than site based now. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, th those changes, you know, obviously with new people coming in, it doesn't really matter, but people that were, have been there for a long time and then now suddenly moving to Perth, I mean, that's a, that's a fairly big change so, for them. So, my, one of the customers we spoke to, one of the things that they were looking to do in terms of automating was um, not so much about efficiencies, but about the fact that they see a lot of people in that mid 50 year old range who know how to operate and run infrastructure moving out of the business. And they're concerned that that knowledge is actually in the hands of um, you know, a set number of people. And then if, once they go, whether it takes five or 10 years, if they don't transition that knowledge from people into systems, um, it, could, it could likely cause some, some issues in the future. Do you see that in your industry? It was more of the oil and gas that we saw that in. Is that similar in, in mining? Oh, certainly, there's, there's uh, I know of some cases where you know you got five percent of your of your uh, work base in some departments own ninety five percent of the knowledge, right. which is a yeah. pretty dangerous place to be. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and those those issues need to be addressed. You've also got Gen Y coming online that have been educated a different way, mm -hmm. are now becoming supervisors and superintendents as well. Yeah. So they're very technology focused, mm -hmm. as opposed to the people that have got experience that have still hands on, so yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a gap there as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you find the, the new workforce coming in, their expectations about the level of technology to be using on the workforce is exceeding your ability to respond to them? Are they looking for... They're looking for iPads, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, whereas uh, you know, the old schools, they, they go and see, find out what's wrong, yeah. right. hear it, grab the, the piece of paper and sort of thing. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, great topic. How about the, um, the topic about regulations and compliance? Is that also driving the clarity in terms of work practice and standard operating procedure? I know there's certainly a lot of safety, compliance, and regulations, but is it also driving down into how the work is performed and how it's actually rolled out um, through the organization? Does that affect you uh, today, Andrew or, or Mike? And I know. Mike, we talked a little bit about some of the procedures that you deal with when you're looking at large projects rollouts as well. I think the mining companies go well beyond what any regulatory requirement is. And, um, certainly, if you probably attest, safety is the backbone of, of mining. And as a vendor, mm -hmm. um, you know you, you have to have a safe, safety component to anything you're doing from a product efficiency point of view. It's just a, it's always in front of mind. Of, from what type of technology you're talking to minds about is, is how is it going to add to safety? Yeah. 
So it's interesting, I was talking to somebody in one of the buildings in town that's watching some of the construction work going on mm -hmm. uh, in some of the high rises. Um, and, you know, the, the indication there is the work practices that they're seeing, right, would just not be tolerated uh, out on site for kind of the way that the mining's work, right? So there's a couple of things, you know, driving that, I guess, but uh, it's an interesting challenge because, you know, you do have uh, efficiency and uh, comparable operating costs that you have to manage through that, right? And when you then compare how that's, you know, you're competing against that with other organisations outside our kind of work practices and safety instructions, that's the challenge that we've got. Right? right. You have to balance always having that work practice along with trying to drive new efficiency, but you can't abandon yeah. the, the same I mean, practices. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you, you don't want anybody to have, you know, uh, a serious problem. You just, you know, people should be fairly safe at work and things like that. So, yeah. um, you know, we probably don't have much tolerance for that kind of activity, whereas other areas clearly they do. Right. right. Is that driving, is that, uh, and we'll talk more about the safety driver in depth later on, but is it, is that actually driving some of the um, technology investments in particular that you see? We talked a little bit about the mine automation, I understand that Rio has done some of that work already. Is that, is, is that a driver around compliance and safety, or is it more around oh, productivity? Definitely, once you start talking about the machine to machine, automated type side of things, there's, the, there's a major uh, safety component, and obviously compliance and governance in that space. Um, and just, just a small example, um, just in the mobility space, uh, there was a safety video that went around the business a few months ago where a guy was just on his smartphone, he was just in an uh, induction office near the gate house. He walked out looking at something on his phone and um, on the guardrail, just as he walked out, there was a brown snake that leapt at him. Mm. Now, if he didn't have his smartphone, he wasn't looking at it, he was sort of snake and it would have been an issue. Yeah. Uh, another discussion topic at the moment is drones. We're starting to use drones for inspection mm. purposes at the moment for surveying and things. Uh, so when you launch a drone on site, what does everybody do? They all look up. <laughs> and they watch the drone. So the, that awareness side of things uh, is a big discussion and I know a lot of the, the, the um, uh, production managers and things like that are, are a bit worried in terms of, uh, you know, people, you know, uh, not aware of what's around them, um, you know, looking at their phones or iPads or whatever they may be, if you start introducing that technology within the business. So that's, that's a big topic of discussion at the moment as well. So, yeah. It's very interesting. We found that um, that's such a big in inhibitor also um, around other markets' adoption of mobility technology. For example, public safety, frontline police. I mean, a lot of the police forces are adopting that technology, but um, we know of uh, numerous cases where, you know, staring at the smart device as allowing as they're apprehending someone, they look down, and all of a sudden the person walks behind them to look over their shoulder and see what's going on in the tablet. So that situational awareness is one of those distinct changes from a commercial use of the technology and an industrial use of the technology that uh, I think a lot of people are grappling with as of just very early days of rolling that out. Yeah. Um, and it does go back to that change management. How do you need to work differently? Yeah, I suppose traditionally, um, well, from my perspective, um, especially coming from broadcast, um, you know, mining was 10 to 15 years behind any sort of industry and technology space. but and actually, from, a, uh, from my perspective, has actually caught up and is, uh, especially with the implementation of LTE, is, is you know, now in cutting edge, which is, whether that's a good thing for mining, I'm not sure, but yeah. um, normally you'd like to have an industry already go through that, um, uh, that training and, and, and lessons learned sort of thing before you introduce it into a, a hazardous environment, I suppose. Right. You're cutting new ground in that area, though, so. It's uh, yeah. How about uh, the, one of the last topics here, I'll, I'll just highlight the cost of downtime. So um, is there kind of a, a commonly understood way of looking at the cost of downtime in a lot of the organizations? Is that a key metric that people are looking at as they look at how to build redundant systems or um, how, to de how to decrease the dependency on communications? Uh, Michael and I were talking about you know, how 
the increased use of communications will also create a higher dependency, and therefore when there's downtime, it could be exas exasperated. Um, so is there a common view of, of how to measure downtime? Is that um, well understood, or is there a, is still a, a number of ways to really help, help get a better understanding of that? I think the common view is there will, will be no downtime. Zero, zero. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, that's pretty hard to uh, achieve, I guess. I, I guess my experience has shown that most organisations have some concept of delay management or costing associated with, you know, impact on production, because I guess it's the risk management between um, components that would impact. Uh, production or processing and how much you're prepared to mitigate against those risks, whether those risks are, you know, can be solved through technology or, or other ac activities, yeah? Yes. And I mean, it's the same as even roster levels and manning levels, right, is, you know, you assess how many people are going to be sick or not there and how many people you actually need to cover off critical functions, right? Mm -hmm. Is there well-established practices during, um, during an outage to restore? And you talked about the delay, minimizing that delay, so that's really about well-understood work practices and employing those. Um, well-understood. I think there's, there's levels of maturity in that process, right? So, you know, traditional kind of IT services um, drive that through SLA responses and, and focused activities and procedures. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that's some of the uh, activities that are driving OTIT kind of merge, uh, you know, emergence and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's a there's a key focus on restoring production, right? So whatever it takes to kind of restore that is right. is the focus point. Well, I think those those um, those questions are in quite early days. Our company is moving more and more to time and attendance and time of equipment and people at the face to actually do the job. And it's been quite an eye opener for me being new to mining to sit in front of a mine manager. Go, well, these are your statistics, and while they knew from an anecdotal point of view where they had operational blockages or, or uh, bottlenecks. And it wasn't until you could lay some data in front of them where they could really see that oh, they didn't need a new dump truck, they needed a new IT because production was held up for four hours because they couldn't find the IT. <coughs> so these types of things, but they, they sort of knew anecdotally, but they couldn't exactly point where they could actually make these small changes. So we, we see this, the reactive focus on fixing something. Oh, you've got intense intention tension at that time, yeah. if it's working you've got sometimes very low levels of tension, yeah. so and I'm building on the point of maturity, because often it's through proactivity, you look at it and go, why does the network go down? It goes down because the diesel generator that someone else is running runs out of fuel randomly every month or so, that's right. and that's the most, the bigger power, it's one of the bigger, I think in most of my sites, is one of the bigger forms of um, unreliability, your batteries that haven't been maintained, or load, and, yeah. and often someone else is running them on the site, so you have these dependencies, and it's the linking together and understanding that chain of what creates high availability, which is some processes and supporting infrastructure, and that continual improvement. Yeah. I think that's where you see the varying levels of maturity, is that mm -hmm. understanding and how it works and, and the linking in with mine operations. And some of these changes that you, you guys talked about are okay, reasonably small, making sure we have a regime to ensure the diesel generators are full, if that's Always. the case. And some of these step changes are, are small, but they make a huge mm -hmm. impact to production. Like um, blasting, you know, we, we sell blasting systems, and um, if, if the, especially those protocols are very safety conscious, and um, but some of them get really spread out there um, because they have no way of determining when it's safe, they will wait too long. So the whole work face is another hour before they're back on the job, and that's huge in production terms. So how do we get that gap down smaller so we're not impacting safety, um, but we're having our workforce back on tools a lot quicker? Hmm. I think the, the issue is about recording the information where you can analyse and improve the process, right? So, you know, what I see typically is, is, as you say, there's a lot of activity around getting production back up and going, um, but not necessarily recording what the outage was, 
uh, or what caused it or you know what the issues was in actually restoring it so that you could go through a improvement process mm -hmm. to either design out the problem or optimise the response so you can um, improve the process mm -hmm. going forward. Right? It's a past tense thing, isn't it? Back up and running. Yeah, yeah I've got other things to do, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, that is very, uh, very much how the situation is, right? Yeah. Grease the squeaky wheel and then move on. Yeah. And diagnose. And wait for the next one to squeak. Right? Yeah. 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 Also, you want to worry, yeah. I mean, the comms exists in an environment where often you've got non-technology people. And, you know, where I've been in different environments, where it's a heavier bunch of ICs, they all instinctively know how to manage and the questions to ask, and you get stronger alignment. But if you're dealing with a non-technology person, they're either frightened about the thing you don't need to be frightened about or vice versa. So it's a more challenging environment. Well, if we work slightly differently here, that will fix the problem. They have some of the natural instincts that we might be used to in other industries where they you know, jointly work towards to improve. It ta takes a little bit longer to evolve. Right. Mm -hmm. and I think the... Um the window of focus is smaller, right? So I worked uh, with an organisation that had a huge amount of skater all over the state, right? And so they have units that have been programmed and configured that nobody now knows what that is. So not only has the technology kind of changed and we've kind of changed our workforce, the controls around what the configuration and what the operational is is very much you know, lost, right? So it just kind of stays there until you know, at some point we kind of replace that technology. Right? Right. That's the cheaper way out of it. Um, but the implications with that is if you've got changing uh, compliance standards, um, you, you don't know whether you're meeting that or, or not wrong. So. Right, you have to review those practices. Is, is there a regular practice review of um, um, looking at situational um, downtime or situational safety practices? Is that a regularly? So I think the push for cost uh, effectiveness, right, is actually changing the ratio of plan maintenance to reactive maintenance. Okay. So what typically happens is it's always easier to cost cut plan maintenance, right, right which then has a knock-on impact at some point of, you know, your reactive stuff is actually going because you're actually not doing your plan maintenance. And I think that is a general trend. So what that means is from a technology, you, you build in resilience or redundancy or you're looking at asset life cycles, things that break down, trying to understand that on a more proactive basis so that you can yeah. do some prediction. But if you have less people and less uh, automation to do that, it becomes, um, or it turns into risk. Well, I think some of that is kind of driving change in what you do with technology. So in, and just from commercial devices and stuff like that. So the reliability of the devices is, probably greater than the cost of actually repairing those. So, you know, the old uh, break and replace versus break and fix is kind of changing as well. Mm -hmm. Bruce, it's an interesting discussion that one was happening a little bit earlier about um, getting your hands on the data so you can diagnose the problems, because um, that's really the centre of this kind of um, efficiency is knowing where the Points of failure. So, is there a move to invest more into the technologies that can help you to get the data that's going to drive the better decision making? Um, from my viewpoint, not yet. I think we're we're still on the cusp. So, with uh, you know devices becoming IP kind of connected, the volume of data is going up. Um, the analytics around that yet. I think is is still a little bit down, particularly for Roy Hill. I mean, Roy Hill is in a implementation build kind of activity, so we're slowly moving into the operation. So we don't have a lot of 
our data. What we do have is, I guess, an expectation of planning for when that will be available because usually what you'll find is, I think, um, the ability for people to analyse that data is going to be a problem because you're going to have so much of it, right? So the the technology that actually drives the analytics and the smarts about analysing is changing, right? It's changing from, you know, on the ground experienced people with mining to more data scientists who can actually naturally see the interrelationship between that data and actually raise it up. You right. still need somebody then to assess kind of what does that actually mean from us from our operational view. Do the data scientists exist in the industry? I mean, do you have access to Because that's a pretty verified skill set. Does that exist here? Or? No, I don't. I, well, I, I, it does, I, does in the In some areas, right. Yeah, a lot of the, certainly some of the top tier um, mining companies certainly have business analysts that traverse data. But to go back to another problem, the companies like Winco and Modular Mining, and because everybody's familiar with, they generate so much data that you know I've I sort of had a customer they're just swimming in it, so they don't know they've got this, they make such an avalanche of data coming in from all their different types of operational machinery, they tend to um, human nature switch off to a lot of where there's probably an awful lot of important stuff that they're that they're mining that they're, the data that they're mining. But to be able to isolate it and actually point to bottlenecks because it's so much data, um, certainly from of these mine management type programs that are just coming at you all the time. Hmm. Tends to go through phases because you go and collect a lot more data, then you realise it's not just data, it's data quality. Yes. And you see the statistics are poor because something wasn't understood, captured, yep. there was a hole in coverage, so you didn't cover that cycle time there. Yep. It's useless. Yep. So a lot yep. of this is getting the data quality up and then. Yeah. Life evolves into better tools that you can plug and make it data, and that's right. Yeah. Takes, yeah, like, takes yeah. time to move that into information, into knowledge, and then decisions. It's so, so that's where I think there'll be a lot, a lot of value because I've heard the same thing. For yeah. Right. Right. I guess the challenge with data quality is it's very hard to justify the expense to achieve it. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you know, there's been uh, for me in a number of roles a lot of challenge to actually. You know, put the case forward to actually say we need data at this quality because we can do things, or this is the opportunity. Whereas, you know, you you have the argument to actually say I've got the level of data that, that I've got and I'm operating. Right? So moving to the next stage is always going to be a challenge. And I think at the end of the day, the solutions will have to handle data being at different qualities and will kind of have to fill the gaps as much as it can or assess that. The other thing I think around this data analytics and stuff is crowdsourcing will kind of be, you know, probably the way that some of this stuff will go because you won't actually have capacity to have some of these type of resources on the payroll all the time, right? Mm. So there's Especially the junior mine, junior mine, as you know. It. I think actually you're more, more optimistic. Actually, it's the formula to deploy your operational system in your sensors. There's better rules. No, I expect coverage to be at this standard. You manage that. That makes the data quality higher. Mm -hmm. So it's the formula of the various ways to deploy it and what, in, what you want to manage. And you can reduce it to a set of really procedures or controls on that's the way I operate. And then data quality is higher. Yeah. So that's usually the and the customer's understanding, I don't need that data. No, I thought I did. Um, but, and I get a lot of situations where we, go, yeah, we get all this data, which was, it's, it's, we, we drown in it. But the yeah. real, the, the, the step changes that I need, but only be such a small part of it. You know, how many trip cycles am I getting per shift? Yeah. Yeah, operator, that's all I need. Um, you know, you know, what, what's my maintenance, CNA maintenance on these people? But, but do you think, and then one of the challenges, we're doing a lot in big data. Right, and talking to lots of customers across lots of different enterprises of which mining is mining oil and gas are one. And what we see is that um, people don't know what they're looking for and they don't know what they're going to find. And this yeah. comes back to this point of investment. Absolutely, everyone's got the same, same challenge, regardless of which, which enterprise it is. But we see, and we've seen examples of where they've aligned weather with turbines. Right? And, they've, and they've seen things that have happened because of the weather that's impacted performance of certain equipment and then they put two and two together so someone is clever enough to put two and two together and what people are looking for in the finance industries and things like this is 
being able to align those different data streams from completely unrelated activities that you start to look at. I think this is one of the challenges for the industry because it's going to be, I think, quite difficult. You take modular mining, right, or you take someone who sells your turbines. They're unlikely, I think, to be the people that are going to solve that problem for you because they're looking very bespoke or very looking directly at their particular industry. I think the challenge for mining customers, oil and gas and all the rest of it, how do you step back? How do you look to correlate that data and get value out of it? And I completely agree, when we've started to look at this, people are looking to generate the same type of results that they've driven before using standard procedures that they've used before, and that they can't justify it. And, and the discussions we've had with them is, look, you're going to have to take a little bit of a leap of faith, build something, start to collect some data, and do it incrementally, and then if you start to get some success, build out. Because if you're going to try and do an ROI on it and get people to invest, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's going to, and we're seeing in the finance industry, I, I don't want to go into it now, but there's some amazing things that they're finding out when they look at correlating what you would, would not even think about correlating with people's behaviour. And that was another question I was going to ask, is privacy. There's lots of data we can collect. It would be very interesting in the mining industry if you've had any pushback from the unions or anything like this that says, I don't want you monitoring me 24 hours a day. And then it comes down to, well, hang on, from a regulatory perspective, if I can monitor your health, should I be monitoring your health? Because right? we can put sensors on people now. We can track people all through the mm. mine. We can check their heart rate. We can check their temperature. We can see if they're stressed. Right? Should we be doing that? Are the regular, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting area as we move into this space. And we, when you talk about being on the cutting edge of technology, and this, this probably opens us up to another area. It'd be very interesting. I don't know if you, if you started to think like that, Mike, or those... Oh, we have. Yeah. I mean, big data's a, a big topic within Rio at the moment. Um, I do see a need, but it needs, as you said, the analytics needs to be across the entire... and evaluated mm. across the entire supply chain, mm. not just through individuals to actually get value out of it um, uh, to, to drive that efficiencies. But health's a big one as well, yeah. with monitoring people on site, especially the... the Resource evaluation teams are in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, looking and doing um, you know, exploration works. Uh, so that's, that's a big one as well. And you're right, that topic has been brought up um, in terms of, you know, how, how much do we want to monitor our staff and things like that? Where does privacy fit in, security, uh, and, uh, and that side of things. But I mean, the, the data usage for us is, um, I suppose, being tier one, it's ex exponentially increasing. Um, we got FIFO workers working in villages. They want, you know, they don't want TV anymore. They want a Facebook, YouTube. Um, so that's we just, you know, and the whole family club collaboration thing um, in terms of, you know, ha having access to services as though you're in a capital city as opposed mm -hmm. to in the middle of nowhere. So we're seeing a big demand in that. Uh, and and video is another one that's going to become fairly uh, intense as well. Uh, moving on, um, you know, being able to. Um, just in the middle of the pit, have a video. Yeah. Someone's got an issue, maintenance-wise. Um, yeah, I want to speak to the, the uh, subject matter expert who might be overseas yeah. um, straight away, so we can get something um, working. So, I, I mean, we see that. I mean, trying to convince people that's the way they're going to go is, is a bit difficult. But, um, uh, but uh, as as we've gone to a remote operations centre. And as I said before, more professionals coming out of the operational area, um, being based in capital cities, you don't have that expertise. So those things like video and uh, on demand and things like that are going to become more important um, in the future. That's Absolutely, probably a personal view of mine rather than a capital view. But yeah, well, it's a great uh, a great lead into the the next topic. Just we're really going into this productivity topic for a moment. But before we close on the big data topic, I think the observation is that you know there there are a number of data visualization tools and capabilities that are out there now that are readily available. In fact, we're using some in our own business in the radio side for radio comms to look across a whole range of different data operationally within our customers and correlate that with the comms and what's actually happening with the individuals. So it's more than just, you know, channel availability and radio uptime. It's more about what are individuals doing, where are they located, what's the trends in the business. So but those data visualization tools are actually quite easy to get to and are available, but I think that the common thread here is having the operational awareness to be able to drive value and understanding out of that data 
And then is it looking for problems? You know, is it, is it understanding what the problems are? Or sometimes it's trying to sift through a whole range of data and finding a problem. So it's that range of uh, people and capability and data uh, integrity that's going to be a whole new area of understanding. And, um, and I would say that, yeah, probably the finance industry, I think, Tom, you pointed that out, it's, that's actually probably the leading industry that's leveraged in a productive way, those big data analytics, but it's a massive opportunity. It'll take, it's more of a people thing than a technology thing. Though. The interesting thing about that stuff would be no on network traffic visualization is how much the, the visualization changes. Correct. Yeah. It's just actually seeing it on the chart and your brain goes, that's a very odd movement for that line. Why is that line doing that? And then it's actually just, it's set up, you see these visual breaks of what you expect and then you drill in and then you work out what down the line causes that. It's really is that visualization makes yeah. the difference. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's worth noting as well in, in WA with the square kilometre array and the amount of data that's been collected on that and the number of data scientists that are going to come into the state yeah. that's going to analyse all the data. There is, there is that we spoke about whether those resources are going to become available. I think we're going to see a lot more of those skills. The universities are focusing on that area and there's a good, I think, tie-up between industry and what the government is funding here. But uh, from a Cisco perspective, we've been looking at how do we how do we align that? How do we take some of the, the work that we're doing there with those skills and align it with um, you know, this big data issue that we see or challenge uh, in some of the other enterprises? Well, I think a lot of it is actually being driven from the commercialization of things, right? So if you look at who, where the smarts are actually coming from this big data, it's companies like Google, Facebook, you know, like, because they're, that's fundamentally their business, right? They hold the data. Yep. And I guess it's about then trickling down that type of stuff into other, you know, other organisations. So if you look at face, you know, image uh, analysis and stuff like that around uh, looking at faces and recognising faces and actions, right? That's, that's being driven from Facebook. And in right. fact, you know, some of that stuff is supposed to be better than what the law enforcement can actually generate. So it's going to be interesting in that way. Right. They've completely commoditized in a good way, no, or maybe no. democratized <laughs> is the better word, right? They've democratized those capabilities, yeah. I was just going to step out for a, a meeting. Sure. Yeah. Sure, thank you. I think we do need to be a little bit careful with, with the, the Googles and the Facebooks. So I think mean, completely agree, right, it's being driven. But as they say, <coughs> if you're not paying for the service, you're the product being sold. Uh, and you do need to be very aware of that, I think. It's interesting to hear from, from Roy Hill's perspective. Eh? Completely, are you looking, would you look to, to have a third party like that being part of your business, or would you prefer to own that uh, and run it yourself? Uh, I think, yeah, there's, there's, it's subjective, right? But um, I think, um, for me personally, I want to know what I'm kind of entering into. Yeah. Right? So, uh, I wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing it. I, I wouldn't be recommending that kind of. Right. But I think what will be happening though is just like, you know, NASA kind of invested in, found, there's a stuff where stuff will trickle out of yep. one environment into the others. Yeah? Um, yeah, well you talked about crowdsourcing before. There's actually a new business out there which is crowdsourcing algorithms and it's competitive. And they're putting the big data into this sort of public competitive environment. And these guys have worked with the likes of Google and those sorts of people are also competing to write algorithms for the person behind that data who wants to pull the information out. And it's amazing what they're pulling out. Yeah, I mean, when, you know, you look at, you know, so organisations like Google, they've got a totally different model, right? They're quite happy to pay, you know, for somebody. They, you know, they'll, some of the, Contractors that they actually use to develop these kind of things, they are paying a salary of two million dollars a year, right? Whereas a lot of all other organisations just can't afford that, so they they attract a certain type of uh, people, you know, associated with that. I think the thing around crowdsourcing is, I think, for a small investment, you know, you can get into that space. Uh, finance, we talked about that. I think they do. You know, they're kind of leading into crowdsourcing. Quite a few of them are actually outsourcing some activity uh, in there. Um, 
we're not there at this stage, right? So. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to move to this topic of increasing productivity because I think is the fundamental topic around gathering the data. But the question is if that's the um, point at which more of the organizations are at today. You know, how do you establish practices and technology to gather the information? And how does that then uh, transform into better productivity? Um, the question is, how does communications and that communications play a role um, in doing and contributing to that productivity? So the question is, what aspects of the productivity are impacted by communications? And I do mean both data and voice. So between your people, as well as between your people and your assets. So what would you say is the, um, the key contributing factor or detracting factor from communications into this topic of productivity? Mobile data. Yeah. Certainly our experience, mobile data. Even voice communications without it, um, you stop production, especially on ones with uh, the whole range. Mm -hmm. um, if your voice system breaks down, which some of us have done, um, it's a big problem because they stop mining. Mm -hmm. right. Nothing gets people jumping more than when you stop production. It's critical. It's certainly mobile data from a point of productivity. Right. I'm getting information from machinery and people. It's, the, it's certainly the big driver around the wireless um, investments and the SCADA investments around, around automation as well. Whether you're in the moving into your autonomy space or whether you're still in your fleet mode. So generally what we see is people in fleet, um, they are tend to be lenient on comms issues, but if it's in full-blown autonomy, then you, yeah, it's right at the heart of um, at what everyone's doing. Yeah. So, um, especially, you know, I would say more so in underground as well, when they have a have autonomy is here because they've, been, they've put autonomy there and move people out of, out of those cars or underground. Yeah. But yeah, that's what we generally see. You see that the uh, communication enabling fleet, fleets, is that generally uh, well adopted and implemented within mines today, or is that still a uh, fork, you know? It's a poor yeah. now. Even though it probably still is a, a, a large majority of the mine that still operates in that space, mm -hmm. um, in terms of tonnage, uh, um, it is still uh, the autonomy is the sexy music, isn't it? So people yeah. lean towards that. But in terms of mine fleets and the, what is proportionate to autonomy, they're running autonomy as opposed to their entire fleet on that mine. Yeah. Um, they're all connected. How do I answer to say, what's being done? For productivity, you've got to do something differently or better. So, I mean, you can say, okay, we're talking about um, in fleet mode, it's comms, it's often, um, it's all the road liaison, demarcation, general comms, but then often, what are you going to do differently? So it's like use cases, go in thinking through those. Because right. often, I saved a trip from someone to go out and check the dam level or whatever, or the, so remote sensing and whatever, but you've got use cases you can say, how can I avoid doing stuff? How can I collapse time? How can I get information? Someone's got a problem that the truck's got downtime. How can I get people and knowledge to fix it and reduce the time? Yeah. And that's, you know, that's some of the cases I'm aware of, but I think they're the ones that help, then you can help answer. So how do I, how do I, how do I change the, the path of things? So from my viewpoint as a consumer, Okay. For me, I want to have uh, communication anywhere within my area of operations, right? So, um, and I want high reliance um, and, you know, I need performance as well because as we kind of move to remote operations and stuff like that, um, delays is an issue, right? And I guess... What we have at the moment is we have a number of different technologies um, to kind of give as much coverage as we're prepared to actually pay for. We've got black spots through that uh, operations that kind of mean 
from a investment and a technology, I need to be able to have my applications working in online and offline mode, which adds to cost, right? Um, you know, and also it gives you limitations about what you can and can't do, right? So if I've got somebody, I've got a team working in offline down the rail corridor or something like that, um, or somewhere, and um, I can't contact them, I can't change what they're doing, I can't necessarily get alerts if they're in trouble and you know, all that type of stuff. So they're all things I think that for us to kind of move to a level, the communication layer has to become a real commodity kind of service, right? It needs to be, for me, it needs to be taken out of the equation. Right? So I just need to kind of have that layer so that you know all my IP driven stuff that's moving into that layer can operate seamlessly. So when you go and, you know, like, so I've put in a number of mobile computing applications, right? And so when you deal with those um, providers, they typically separate themselves from the communication layer. They just sit on top. Right. And where all the problems are going to be is actually going to be between, you know, the education of those vendors that I'm in an environment that you can't necessarily rely on that communication being, being interrupted there, at any case. Right? Or, yeah, not being interrupted or whatever. Right? So that's part of the challenge for me. And then leveraging off of all that is kind of what I need, right? Because, you know, the SCADA, the reliability around uh, mobility, you know, having, having my systems and my capability operate anywhere is where I drive value. And value for me is either, you know, I can do more with less or I can actually drive my cost down and quality up and all those type of things. Right, again, getting into the measuring the use cases and the specific, yeah. what's different. And, and, and the other thing I think to note around communications is um, uh, bandwidth utilization of consuming systems mm. is going up, mm. right? So. No matter if we're talking about, you know, I've got my people in my uh, uh, my camps who actually want, you know, internet access and they want to stream videos and they want to, you know, like so they're con they're uh, consuming capacity is going up or, right. you know, I've got more SCADA units out there feeding all this information in. I've got more bandwidth. Mm -hmm. I've got automation which kind of drives the rail corridor to, you know, we want hundreds of megabytes of data bandwidth is, is bandwidth all... Bandwidth would be a huge yeah, equation for you. Yeah, it's all, it's all a challenge, right? So... Yeah, security around that as well. Yeah. yeah. And that will never reduce, would it? Because because the, the type of data you're collecting and the different things you collect it on is only going to make yeah. the quote for bandwidth bigger and bigger. I mean, it's just going to get... You know, like, you just, you just take mobile devices, right? So, you know... Ten years ago, right, it was all just kind of voice, right? Yeah. Now data and now video and, you know, at some point, you know, the old Dick Tracy watch is kind of mm -hmm. there. You know, like, so it's all just kind of incrementally exploding, right? Yeah, I've always seen. It'd be quite interesting to hear the, the opinion on the sort of future of voice, like, staying in the future, Voice is a hygiene thing, like it just has to be there. It's not about driving productivity, so if you can't operate in mind, it's not. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's certainly today, and, and, and our open cut mines where we, we've got um, the machinery, if your voice system goes down, they generally stop production, if they don't have redundancy. And, um, and some of the, the top tier um, miners that have really robust systems, they have that redundancy, but an awful lot don't. So, what does that redundancy look like? Um, how do they build that redundancy? Um, going from a trunk network down to be, to be able to operate in a subex environment or in a standalone point to point to, to manage that area that's gone down to still operate. Um, from ROMs, you know, from the ROMs where they're loading um, the ore to um, haulage roads being able to, there's lots of different things they will put in place to ensure they can still produce. Yeah. So would that be true, you think, Andrew, that voices, just, you can't operate without voice? 
or as, as automation comes on stream, is that going to I guess it kind of depends if you're automated or not, right? That's right yeah. At some point, right? But I would think that a tolerance for not being able to contact somebody or somebody not being able to contact us is pretty low. I mean, that's why we have, uh, you know, radio as well as kind of other communication methods, right? whether it's the mesh pit or whether it's other things, right? So not only is it about the data transfer, but it's also about, you know, being able to talk to people. I suppose it doesn't matter how automated the system is, at some point there's a chance a human has to go in and sort something out and you sure. can't send them in if they don't have voice. Yep. No, but I guess then you've got uh, a change in strategy of saying, well, can I use a sat phone, right, because the, the need to do that is, you know, I'm not going to pay for a total coverage on the off chance, right? In underground mining, it's different, right, mm -hmm. because you've got limitations and stuff like that. But clearly, right, we need to be able to talk to anybody on site. So, Andrew, in, in Roy Hill, is there uh, a wide adoption of mobile smart devices and technology for the workers yet? Or is that still in its infancy? Where does that sit within your operation? So, um, we have a number of applications that have mobile components, mm -hmm. okay. Um, but we're ramping up, right? So, right. so for us, I, under that scenario, it's a cost benefit, right? So um, it's part of the challenge to kind of work through. Mm -hmm. You typically um, in, or envision giving that more to staff supervisors or every uh, staff, think, or again, I it depends upon their operation. Where it kind of relates to their job. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think we're at the stage yet of, you know, uh, assuming that a mobile device is like a telephone, right? Every desk has to have one. Uh, what you know, what um, what's been discussed is the safety issues around devices, right? So, you know, having having people looking at their devices, I think the challenge there is educating people around the safety factors associated with you know operating devices while you're kind of walking around or operating machinery, and mm -hmm. you know, I think there's a fairly big. Um, issue there that we kind of need to work through. What, what does the word data mean to you guys, and, it, and how is that changing? So is it video, or is it... Anything non-voice? <laughs> and is it changing? I mean, are you getting, like, is video part of that data? Is it an important growing part? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, when you, just from an operation of remote, remote operation centres, right? So people who are not, you know, don't have the opportunity to obtain situation awareness is going to be a big thing, right? Because the visualization of things from a from a 2D kind of operating screen with a set of figures or whatever is an issue, right? You you know the old picture says a thousand words. Well, that's really true, right? So I think you know more and more um, the convergence of different type of capabilities are just going to be underlying, right? So whether it's voice, whether it's data, whether it's video, whether it's uh, anything else that kind of comes along is is just going to be seamlessly needs to come through, right? Because basically the more of that stuff you can bring through the system and provide you yeah. Yeah. And really, you know, from a consumer Actually, you don't care, right? You, all you want is a set of capabilities. You don't actually care what the underlying technology or methods that you're obtaining, right? So if you, you know, if you can't use an IP or you can't send data, you want to be able to talk to the person, whether it's on a telephone or whether it's on a radio or whatever. You, you actually don't care, right? So, and, and with that data, all that video. Stay, would that be constant, or would you talk sort of beat during the video? So it's only coming in. I think then what you're now talking about is limitations around technology, right? So if the cost was not an issue, right, then then I wouldn't really care about whether that video stream was full time and I just tapped into it, right? 
So in an operational centre, there's there's always you know if you've got 50 people doing that, <coughs> you think that there's always a need to kind of see what's happening, and you might have wanted uh, standing feed coming in for people. There will always be you know you're not going to do that for a thousand cameras. Right, so there's always a need to kind of say, I've got a particular need and I want to optimise that because, you know, I don't want five people looking at the same thing, having five different streams of, you know, seven megabits a second coming down or whatever it is. Right? Could you give an example of, of a need-driven video in a mine? Like what, what, what sort of scenario would that be? Okay, so somewhere in the processing plant there's, there's a SCOBY unit is alarmed for some reason, mm -hmm. right? You want to, you know, you want that to come through, right? Or, you know, for example, maybe one of the bins is filling up or something, right? Particularly around, uh, you know, utilities, you would kind of have water or sewage or, or you know, any of those kind of things that you would kind of want to um, trigger off um, on the in-pit trailers, right? We've got cameras. So I guess if there was a, an issue, a sensor there to actually say some, something's come close to that and trigger off something like that, right? So any of that security stuff I would think would be one of those events that you might need to kind of trigger off. Um, if you had, you know, some of the trucks kind of come into a convergence with something or an intersection or you know some issues there you might want to pull that stuff out and alert right because what you'd be trying to do is take the thousand cameras that you might have and actually you know it's no different to any IT um, monitoring capability right you actually just want to know I just want to deal with the, the triggers yeah. you know what's the What's the things that are important, the things Except that are not, mm -hmm. right, I, I might want to record for some event, but, you know, I can't deal with them. Can you envision also that there's a personal video use case? You know, there's this, um, certainly a big topic in areas like public safety about equipping officers with cameras for um, not only their own safety, but also the... Uh, compliance and really making sure that there's a, a good accountability system as well. But do you see that there's opportunities for uh, equipping people with cameras, not just machines or fixed locations? I think so. I think when you were, you know, maybe some, there'd be, you know, a lot of the police are doing it now, right? So um, I would think you'd have the same <coughs> set of requirements, right, at some point. Right. Maybe, um, maybe there'd be an opportunity also for, say, equipment diagnostics or something that's really specialised that you know, there's only not many people can get to, and that specialised person might be elsewhere in a rock or. Right. It happens now. Like like drill rigs, they do it. With yeah, drill yeah. Rigs. Mm. You know, the drill rigs. They've got a problem with the drill rig. They have a, a, a tablet they can send down. It's predominantly an underground. They'll send down whatever the like an aeroplane checklist with the pilots going through. Well, we've got a cock up here, we're going to do these. They'll send their checklist to the draw rig underground and yeah. he'll do it. He'll go through his well, I reckon video would be used a heck of a lot more if the, um, if the bandwidth wasn't such a bad issue. Yeah. 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 You know, an underground mine is very prevalent for the <coughs> operations yeah. remote place for um, um, bad intersections where they continue have incidences. Yeah. Um, and also the, the event management, which um, I mean, was talking about. I think the issue is is really, you know, for us around the video, it would be if there was a a situation occurred and I and I have somebody at the back end who needs to you know determine what the problem was. Right? So if there was an accident, I'd want to be able to see the vehicle number, I'd want to be able to yeah, like I need to be able to do that. So the level of quality, which is always an issue between okay, so what do I actually feed? Right is is the challenge, right? Yeah, I think there's also just to change it slightly. There's a difference between mobile and mobility. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people have understood all that yet. Mm -hmm. So mobile uh, means a mobile application on on an iPad or does is is different. This mo that's mobility. Mobile means high up to high speed, and right. with 
the broadband technologies are different depending on which, which one you're trying to do. So if, if you've got a Wi-Fi or Wi mesh network for mobile devices, that works fine. But that won't work in a, in a high-speed mobile environment or a travelling environment. So we're seeing what we're doing um, is that uh, not just mining companies, but most companies don't under, haven't really has that understood all that. And I think you said, Andrew, you know, you've got you just want to have an IP network. You just want want connectivity. But then that's where the specialisation comes in about understanding what's appropriate for what type of application, whether it be voice or data, and, and what you're trying to do. Because unfortunately, the underlying technology plays a big, has a huge impact on on how uh, your applications will work. And that's from railway signalling, um, where they're trying to do things on Wi-Fi at high speed, and it's not built for it. That so roaming capability is not. Yeah, handover and, and roaming and things like that. So. Um, that's one part we're seeing is, is I think, and if Michael's here, he, you know, he, they're, they're championing the LTE in, in PIT um, because their Wi-Fi, Wi mesh network really doesn't give them what they want. Right. And we're doing some work for, for other companies as well. Um, and I think the other, the other part is understanding the applications you're trying to run through. Uh, we're doing some work for another mining company and, and the amount of work educating vendors in, this isn't a cellular type broadcast environment where you're dealing with a million subscribers. This is a, a high reliable, high functionality requirement for a low number of users in a set set area. And the, the private LTE is where the, getting them, the vendors to understand that is is, is not, not easy, as well as the business as well. So All of those technologies have different cyber security challenges. And then you've got well. on top of that. Yeah. So you've got lots of different types of technology you've got to think that that yeah, as we get more mobile and more data out there, you can have more intrusion issues as well. So security is definitely something we need to keep up with. One of the, one of the differences that we see um, with the LTE technology and the use in the critical industries is the fundamental difference between uplink and upload versus download. So yeah. Typical consumer orientation is downloading lots of information, you know, streaming videos, looking at Facebook. Um, obviously, in a critical industry, it's about uploading information and sending it back to a command center or to a manager or doing Unless something or in the video, it. as an example. Um, so what is, are the use cases in mining aligned typically with, um, it could be something like just data capture or accessing an ERP system, but when you're looking at video, it's, I assume it is going to be more of an upload. It's going to be a transferring it from the work site back somewhere else, collaborating. Yeah. I think I think we've got the two user cases right. So there's there's definitely uh, the way of taking information from the mine and the sites uh, back into the typically the enterprise area, right? So. Um, for us, you know, we've got a remote operating centre at, um, at our headquarters and so the interaction between typically what the OT, IT might be for some people is be begins to get merged right? mm -hmm. as not only is it about the volume of information actually coming back um, and the timeliness of that. Right? The other change that I kind of see is the ability to serve up information to the on-site operations people, right? So not only is it I'm just going out there with, you know, I've got a number of folders in the truck with all the information that I might need, I actually want to do that online. I want to feed back to my safety or my instructions or uh, in the situation where we spoke before about, I actually want to talk to, you know, some some expert somewhere, and he could be at any location, right? Or he could actually be at the other end of the mine, right? So, any combination of those <coughs> is um, is going to be interesting. You brought up the talk, topic of kind of work instructions and work order management. Um, you know, this balance and change between that being done in the past, or maybe now in what's still a lot of cases through a voice communication versus a structured work order management that's done through pushing data or pushing instructions out. Um, 
is that is that something that is a, a prime area of productivity gain? You think? I mean, obviously, it depends on the work scenario, yeah. but is I, that? I think so. Scenario? I mean, in the past, when we just kind of had radio, right? Yeah. Then you can only do a certain amount of things, and it and it was very much voice driven, you know, with with people talking about do this, do this, do this, or whatever. Nowadays, I think it is very much visualization, right? I need to be able to, you know, I want to, I want to see a YouTube video of what do I do in this situation, right? Because for us, it's always a trade-off between, you know, the technology that we're using, the experience of our workforce. Hmm. Uh, I think there is a, you know, there is a trend for. Um, <coughs> people being younger, not being as experienced, or having the breadth of coverage, right? And they very much, you know, the younger generation is very much, I, I jump on it and I'll just kind of look at how I do something at a point in time, rather than, you know. Learning and... Well, you just got to go out to restaurants and see, they're all, you know, you know somebody asks a question, they say, oh, I'll just Google that, right? So. So they want to be able to do that in the market. Well, I think there is that kind of trade-off because I think with the volume of uh, different technology and things being driven, I think um, maybe the depth of experience of some people is kind of changing. Right? People tend to move around a bit more. And they, I guess they always have in mind at some level. But usually... You know, and you have some pretty sound foundations with experience and stuff. Like, I don't know what your experience is with. with yeah, uh, no, uh, similar to that. Um, even the uh, technicians, engineers, um, they don't want to read manuals. <laughs> you know, that's a, I haven't been trained, but if I can't work on this, or you know, is it on YouTube? As you said, <laughs> someone that can show me. I said, well, there's a thousand-page manual there. You could probably read that, but. You know, so it's just a different um, way they've been brought up or schooled or whatever it is. Sort of thing. How structured do you need to be then? I mean, if, if a lot of these practices are um, well documented or even videos and training videos and other things, do the work procedures, um, how, how closely well understood or how closely fabricated are the work procedures today? In other words, do you have the opportunity to get the kind of productivity gains through technology or do you? Is there still a lot of work to be done to establish specific step-by-step -step work procedures? Um, you know, the, the, the processes are still paper-based a lot, yeah. um, but it's um, if you're talking about a maintainer sort of thing, it's when those the procedure or their process that they follow doesn't fix that issue, and then you know how do they get more information? Do they drive back to their their workshop, get the manual and read it, or can they just access it online, get the drawings they need, things like that. So when you start to, you know, retrieve drawings such as DGN files and things like that, that you know have a, uh, you know can be fairly big, big. Uh, uh, then you need, you know, uh, your wireless systems. If you think the on the mobility solution needs to be fairly. Um, so in a dream scenario, we we your ICT systems are taking you, how does a maintainer's working day look? I mean, are they out in the field all the time, whilst you're connected all the time, access to all the information they need all the time? I mean, that's probably the optimal. Is that what you is that what you're It's a generation about? thing. Uh, again, you know, going back right from the start about the guy that's, you know, 50 plus, um, yeah. as opposed to the guy that's 25 plus. Yeah, the guy that's 20, you know, 20 to 25, he wants to be connected all the time. The guy that's 50, you know, he doesn't want to work with other people or work more time with them. Is he is he part of the team? Has he got a boss in a, in a building they're all, somewhere he's talking to? Yeah, they're all part of the team. It's it's funny that it's uh, I think you need to we've found that if you if your network infrastructure is not capable of supplying the solution, then no one's ever gonna take that. You know, it doesn't matter how good your user end device is, no one's gonna actually look at it. Just, they'll throw it in the bin, they'll blame the user end device. Your network has to be robust, reliable, fast for anyone to actually use anything. Yeah. So you've got to get that right first before you even start talking about the um, And security and bandwidth too, we were talking about it before when yeah. you were out. And, uh, yeah, so your quads, 
policies and all that sort of stuff need to come into it as well, yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, we've seen major changes introducing LTE into that space. The actual users are actually now coming up with the business drivers, not us anymore. Mm. But, you know, before they couldn't, we, we'd have to say, you know, well, you could do this, you could do that, this might be, you know, is that... Now that all the ideas are coming to us from them, now that they've had, um, you know, a taste of what it can actually do. Are you some sort of online working environment, team working sort of platforms for them to collaborate in? We, we do. We, I mean, there's... <laughs> we, we got multiple collaboration platforms... Um, uh, that we use, uh, um, some work better than others. Um, um, but you know, being a global organisation, it's very hard to get everybody. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and the bigger the company are, the, the, <laughs> the more disconnected you can be in certain areas. So what what well. platforms do you use? Is an Adobe collaboration platform? We've got our own Reopedia, We call it um, we use Yammer. Um, there's also our e rooms. Um, Yes, we've got a lot of like Skype. Uh, well, we've got ACS, uh, you know, from Microsoft that you know, people can do, but yeah, you, you name it, it's out there, we use it sort of thing. So, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but we do have um, community of practice meetings with different technology <coughs> arms at different levels. So, I'm in one, there's another level above me that others are in, and then there's another, um, you know, sort of GM type form that um, will then set. So Mike, given that you've got some of that underlying technology, network technology, LTE there, and now your users are bringing forward a lot of ideas, I would assume that the cycle of innovation to implement a new application is probably on the order of, you know, weeks or months as opposed to years. How do you manage, uh, for example, if a user has an idea and they want to implement it or you evaluate that and there's a business case for it, are you, are you creating... Um, new applications, new form-based applications, and going through those rapid cycles? Uh, yeah. Well, the, we're, we're capturing all the ideas and customer requirements at the moment. Right. Uh, we've just completed a whole mobility strategy, right. um, and that's based on well, how we're going to do it, the and the security aspect of that, and uh, as you've been talking about, Quas, how we're going to manage that amount of data as well. Right. So we need to do that work first up, up front before you even start putting um, new applications, yeah, otherwise, yeah. Bruce, can we talk about the cyber security aspect of this a wee bit? Because I'm really interested in all these, this sort of free form. What does that mean for cyber security? Because mine must be regarded as a relatively sort of strategic national aspect, all those sorts of things. I mean, we worry that people have their eye on some sort of disruption or well, economic the, gain or whatever. Well, the issue is, so, I mean, we've got a private LTE network which makes it easy for us to manage. So, I mean, if others are looking at using a telco, for instance, um, and then they're bringing their own devices, so the BYOD thing in, you know, how do you manage that security aspect of someone bringing an application in from externally onto your network and what the ramifications might be. So it's a big issue uh, that, you know, every company's going to have to address. Um, and, and that's why we've gone through a bit of a mobility strategy in that space, because uh, that was one of the number one issues that, we, that needs, needs to be addressed. You're definitely doing right. I mean, we've we've worked with a number of customers that have jumped to the implementation side, handed devices and applications to individuals without putting in place the governance, security, and the strategy over a long period of time. Yeah. And it becomes difficult to unwind and do again. Um, yeah, I think it's worth noting on the BYD and COPE strategies, there's enterprises like that today. So yeah. it's it's not something... Agreed, a mine, a mine is an asset that people would like to compromise, but in the same way, you know, for example, Cisco, if someone could compromise our IT, that would be a fairly high value target, you would imagine. And we have a BYOD strategy, right. and it comes down to <coughs> putting in processes and procedures and watching the traffic. Uh, and um, th there are mechanisms today to, to limit. So, for example, in the mine, we've spoken to the mining customers um, about couple of options for CPE so you can control a per bandwidth limit per application and you can lock it down. So even if they do, like one customer we were talking to said, look, I don't mind if someone comes in on the Wi-Fi and smashes it because I'm only going to give them you know, half a meg, let them, right? I don't care, right? But they're not connected to the rest of my network. And similarly on these devices, if they're a cope device, you know, we have things like secure OSs that you can actually, the operator 
for example, the mine can actually say, okay, I can allocate those devices, they'll work, but I can control what runs on them with, a, with an MDM or something like that. So there are tools out there, but it, it comes back to having a policy, having a strategy, and implementing it, yeah. and then it's not, you know, set and forget. You've got to then manage it like right. anything, because you are going to be someone who's going to try and compromise you at all times. Right. It's happening, isn't it? Yeah, it'll continue. I mean, it doesn't take you long. You put anything online, and within 20 minutes, if it's not secure, you will be compromised. Yeah. Right? It's, it's uh, immediate. Right? Um, you, you've only got, uh, you do it yourself, but you, if you want to have a look, just put, put a machine online and have a, a zero day exploit and see how long it takes. You can just see it. So that, that's why, from, a, from an IT department, they've got to be vigilant and continually, because the zero day exploits are continually coming. Right? So it's not something that you can. Uh, Set and forget, and it's layers. You've got to have those layers. Okay. Yeah, my, my, my own personal view is, from a mobility perspective, we shouldn't be trying to control anything or write anything. It should only be a, a monitoring tool, a whitelist, and yeah. that's it. That's yeah. thing, so. um, but others will always have a different view to that within yeah. the business. Um, that's a whitelist versus a blacklist, where you say I'm only going to allow rather than I'm going to disallow. Disallow. Yeah. On the topic of BYOD or a company owned, what's the strategy that you're employing, Mike, at Rio Tinto? Is there any BYOD or is it all company provided? Uh, there is. Uh, it's probably a bit more of a hybrid thing mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, you know, the whole Android versus Apple thing is, <laughs> right. is uh, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, we were a company that um, only issued Blackberries uh, recently. Uh, to, recently, so um, that's still ongoing at the moment. Um, uh, again, you know, our IT area wants to push the whole um, BYOD thing. Um, I'm, st I'm still not convinced um, that's a good thing at, at this stage, but um, it is moving forward. Uh, again, it's locking down those policies. Uh, uh, Security is a big thing, but also um, the other thing is uh, uh, the safety and safety side of yeah. the business as well. I mean, I, I don't want, you know, um, Joe Blow technician being able to access the train control <laughs> on his smartphone and, and, yeah. and do things with that, you know. So um, that that's, you know, that's one of the issues I suppose I have personally. But um, look, it's, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of making sure those policies are in place and those procedures, as you said, yeah. are locked down. Not to mention things like the device ruggedness and you know, yeah. intrinsically safe devices, other things. I mean, there's obviously options out there for those things today, but it needs to be managed in a governance policy yeah. for I mean, the mining, users to bring the right device. Yeah. Yeah. Mining's a fairly simple industry. I mean, we can, we can get rocks out of the ground and yeah. crush, crush them. them on a boat. Can gather and talk about standards and things. Are they happening mining around these issues, or are you guys all relatively independent and yeah? Sorry, what was it? Sorry, what was it? In other industries, we've seen the industries get together and I think there's been, uh, recently there's been a fair bit of collaboration between different industries. Um, and with mining, uh, I suppose now coming up to speed and, and catching up to the rest of the mining technology. Uh, so recently we've had um, a fair bit of conversations with um, other industries in that space about what they're doing. Um, I suppose that, that all comes down to the personnel that the mining companies employ as well. So the mines all very different, that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. There's the other element of uh, ITS, basically, which is intelligent transport systems being implemented through national road networks and then implemented back end into the mines as well. So we look into that space. So, Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Thanks, Thanks for joining. We're just completing uh, right before lunch here a topic around uh, productivity. Good <laughs> yeah, good timing for me. Um, one of the things that we also want to touch on is really this um, machine to machine communications and SCADA. And it's obviously been a big area of investment uh, within the mines. Do you see that there's still uh, a large need to automate and continue to automate assets? and monitor assets, um, and is an, an area of growth within the mines that um, uh, is receiving attention and investment at this point. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um,
automated drilling. Being done by miners, um, slate monitoring. Proximity collision avoidance. That's, yeah. that's, that's a big thing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm. It, it takes people out of the uh, hazardous environment I mean, from a safety perspective. I, mean, I think that's one of the good things it does. I mean, um, especially with our surveyors at the moment, with some of the stuff we've done with them, they're completely away from any sort of um, you know, uh, areas collapsing or anything like that. They can um, survey a, a, an area without even having to go into that area. So from that perspective, yeah, I mean, that's always going to continue to um, develop in that space. Could you quantify the sort of the safety gains that have come from the stuff? Like, what would you estimate that the improved level of safety is that's coming from the ability to remotely monitor? Oh, look, we've had a couple of publicised um, walls collapse, um, no fatalities, luckily, but it was picked up by systems that you know, some of them have noticed. Uh, so in the past, it was very likely to be <coughs> cable or that sort of stuff. Oh, people, yeah, operating in that area. Um, so, yeah, so that was picked up. And you got a warning. We yeah. got a warning. They knew it was going to collapse at some point, and all the mining operations were pulled out of that area. Hmm. What sort of warning would come out? Did you give you days of warning, or minutes, or...? Oh, no, they had, you know, a, a good good couple of months uh, on that sort of thing. <coughs> so just, um, just, uh, Displacement um, in the wall. Um, so these are little sensors, and they're wirelessly connected. Is that? They're like little prisms um, uh, put into the uh, the slope, and then there's a uh, what they call the Trimble 4D system. There's other systems there. Fires a laser and takes a measurement, um, you know, a precise measurement of that, and then just looks at displacement and whether there's been any movement. From that, they gather whatever data and then they um, analyse that to see what the risk of that wall possibly collapsing. And is that all wirelessly connected back to a command centre? So you're looking at. Uh, so that's in a real time? In the pit. <laughs> yeah. So that'd be wirelessly connected back to something, yeah. uh, which then, you know, backhaul to a server somewhere and then an operator analysing that data on these applications. How about other, other types of high value assets, machines and other things? I mean, yeah, so we've got our automated drilling sort of thing. So yeah, I mean that's taking operators away from mm -hmm. um, the drilling areas and things like that. And that's uh, uh, that now is um, uh, we've got two or three drills operating automatically, um, mm -hmm. manless drills. So, yeah. so there's a command center somewhere with people watching that over that. It's not totally the time, right? It's got no, 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 no. So it's obviously an operator uh, doing that. Um, Managing it remotely. Um, yeah. At this stage, uh, you know, probably not not something you can you know base someone in another country and yeah. operate it somewhere else. But uh, I mean, that's where it possibly it, it potentially will be. And so, what new technology carries the control signals to and from the wireless? Well, that's on our LTE network at the moment. Yeah. So they've tried everything, um, you know, ISMB and Wi-Fi and things like that. But LTE seems to be the only technology at this stage that was uh, reliable enough to actually and give people confident enough that, that they can actually start pulling people and looking at potentially basing people in Perth to operate those systems remotely. Wow. And you see that as a bandwidth requirement as well that would drive LTE? Uh, bandwidth requirement, well, well, it depends on how much video. Uh, to be honest, the machine-to-machine -machine data is not that much. Small usually. Uh, it's small. Uh, it's more the latency issues um, that you need to uh, worry about, uh, uh, but we do pull about six video streams off those drills. So um, over a wireless platform, obviously that um, can get fairly um, uh, big in terms. If you've got two or three drills operating, you know maybe possibly on one cell, then you need to be um, take that in consideration. Careful with the planning and capacity yeah. and congestion. Yep. How about you, uh, Andrew? In terms of what you're planning and the rollout for. Uh, looking at automation and SCADA, is that a, a really big part of the, the rollout at the, of the new model? So, from our viewpoint, I guess we're fairly big at, at the SCADA level. Um, automation, I think, for us is about whether the technology is proven. Okay. Um, and I 
I'd say he's not quite there yet. It's getting close, but um, I guess to a certain degree we are automation ready, if you like, in the sense of some of our foundation stuff is kind of there. The mine is, is you know, because you can design. You can design a lot for automation and things like that, um, and I think you know, we've had the opportunity to do that. So um, um, I guess you know, for us, it's um, at some point, right? So there's a lot of uh, long lead time to kind of make some of these decisions. So we're kind of reviewing in, in that process at the moment. I think the opportunity for me around the machine to machine is as you kind of connect components of the demand chain, that's kind of where the value starts to come. So at the moment we're probably in isolated areas. So where it's um, drilling and blasting or whether it's automation, you know, to trucks, uh, rail components, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think as you start to connect those components together, is kind of where I think you know the future will be. That mm -hmm. may be you know, ten years down the track, I guess, as you kind of start to do that. The challenge then is um, those systems are usually different, right? So the big drive I think to leverage some of that is the development of the connection standards the operating standards between that different technology, which I think is going to be the big challenge, right? Because the vendors in those areas is very much, you know, um, isolated through that process, right? right? And for me, it's actually then going to be, how do I take, how do I control and how do I take information and I connect it to the next component in the demand chain? Because really what you want is you want trucks, to dump into the train or the processing plant, out the processing plant onto onto a train, straight onto the, trip, the ship. Right, that's the optimal kind of value, and we, you know, I'd say we're a long way from that. Presumably, I mean, with that, with that comes the need to have that proven capability. Absolutely, it has to be rock solid. I think it was earlier you mentioned that there's always challenges with. Uh, things like coverage and black spots um, in the environments that you operate in. How do you um, how do you manage that black spot mitigation today? And will that play a bigger role in this need for automation? And maybe, um, like you would want to share a little bit about your rollout of LTE a little bit. Is did you face that challenge, and how do you how do you address that when you get to the level of automation that you're looking to do? Um, then it has to be a you know, a black black spot free environment as much as so I see there's probably two ways, right? One is you kind of design out the black spots, right? So so whether it's overlapping capability or reliance on technology and stuff like that, the the other way is you build the intelligence <coughs> into the components to actually handle black spots. Okay. So um, you know, for example, you know, I've still got a system that actually can handle collisions and stuff like that, whether I'm in the black spot or not. And then the challenge would be when that collision risk goes away, I recommence what I'm doing, right? So that's the intelligence that you kind of have to build for it to, to work at the end to end way. And I still think, you know, we're a long way. At the moment, what I see is vendors you know, the vendors actually doing the work in this space are their, their business is selling trucks and selling trains and selling stuff like that. They're not necessarily in the software development business and that's a maturity. So the OME, so the OME has got his product but he wants to have something on that on his product that can, can connect to something. Mm. And then you've got the miner or the client who wants it to be uh, efficient in every way, and there's the gap between that, that it's still, um, it's still opaque in that space, I think. 
So I don't think we've got enough. So we, you know, like as an industry, we haven't got together and we don't apply uh, enough pressure to actually force a standard to actually operate at that level, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and I'm not even sure we could, right? So that's kind of where I see the challenge is going to be, right? Yeah. And the issue will be whether there's a ever an opportunity to actually naturally achieve that. Hmm. Uh, I guess I, the open standards would be a great thing. Yeah. If everybody had open standards, especially like you're talking about the OEMs, truck manufacturers, you know, from CAT to Hitachi to Lever to Sandvik mm -hmm. to um, Komatsu, they all operate different VIM systems because we have to connect to them. And it's like the mine operator wants this information going, well, I mean, no one knows what that's written in, so there's no general standard. Mm -hmm. This is related but slightly off topic. I mean, I must say, I see the way mine is going here and out of a long background in carrier telecoms. This is the largest lock in opportunity for the big equipment manufacturers that they've ever had in their lifetime. Yeah. You know, it's obviously deal synergies and relationships, but the the classic, let's build an application platform tightly integrated into every bit of equipment. I just see that coming. Um, yep. And there is no open standard. It is it's a complex business. It's not trivial. It's tried and it's semi failed with core telecoms 20, 30 years ago with open stacks and some information models. Um, so there's a lot of value there, but it's the biggest lock in, and everything is proprietary. You can't share, can't explain the, the in some cases, the, you know, anyway, that's quite just. It's not the best answer for the whole industry. Um, it doesn't let you innovate on whether it's collision detection systems separate from the equipment. Everything is so tightly integrated. Mm. The level you can optimise, I don't know, maybe a core piece of infrastructure choice and this system and that system goes away. You know, it's, let's look at it and it's, it's a big play, a very big player game which will squeeze out of the play. Yeah. It's some of the big ones like Kamasu who operated their own um, cloud now where you know, for a fee, you'll go on there and they'll you'll buy the information from your trucks on your site outside your yeah. window. Mm. But, you know, uh, that, that is all proprietary. You know, they have got the Motorola model where it's like everything's going to have to connect into this box. Oh yes, yeah. No open standards, but you know, they they they're looking to. We're in that space, and so we we fits us like her and the the Winkos and those other guys. And it takes an awful lot of reverse engineering, but it is doable. But the mines pay for it. Because it's not simple and open and easy. Yeah, the bigger, the bigger players then play a reverse game of changing. You know, this game's played out of keep changing. You've got the new version with the new features and That's continually right. breaking yeah. others. So I just think it's an open game. No, and if the mine captain you talked about, um, where Andrew was about not putting out pressure, um, just, just in the Western Australia, these two guys here control a horrendous amount of um, capital that goes into large mining equipment. So we're not going to buy any more. Buy and what's the most open protocol? Atlas Copco run an open protocol firm system. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to go Atlas Copco. We need to, you need to be able to plug and play other stuff into it. And that's at the application layer and the connectivity layer. I mean, the network, the networking choices are becoming more and more open. Obviously, LT would be a big game changer there in terms of driving that open standard. But you know, now at the end equipment and now at the application layer, there's a whole new. Um, paradigm to break there in terms of opening all that up and creating the API layers and this yeah. strategy to share information. Yeah. Good. Well, we're coming up on lunch. Um, there's one other topic which is close to our heart, which is around um, voice communications. We touched on it earlier, the role of voice over time will uh, change or probably play a continued role in critical communications, but maybe less day-to-day -day business as usual, as that becomes more and more automated. Um, I'd be interested to get some of the uh, viewpoint around the role of different underlying technologies. Um, LTE is moving towards uh, the standards with 3GPP to move towards push-to-talk and other um, critical communication standards as part of the release uh, 13 and 14, 12, 13, and 14 of 3GPP. So we see in our business a true convergence of the technologies, but we also see that there'll be a, a transition from the um, narrow band to the broadband communica voice communications over time. 
and there'll be a continued need to integrate those technologies. So, for example, we're working on things to allow um, the interoperability, but also for the user to um, see really kind of an invisible usage of the, the network there and just continuing to talk no matter what um, network they're on. So if they roam in and out of broadband coverage and a narrow band coverage, they'll get exactly the same service that they're used to. Um, so I'd be interested to see what the viewpoint is around the time frame where voice communications could be served on a technology like LTE. And do you see that as a driver for your investments in those newer broadband technologies as well? Mike, would you like to comment a little bit? Was that? Uh, yeah, well, the well, well, <coughs> voice side of things at the moment, we're, we're just we're still running an analog network. Um, you can sign in voting. Um, we have uh, various channels used throughout our mines, ports, and rail areas. Um, expands a, a rail voice network expands a, a fairly big area. Um, a few years back, we we looked at digital, um, but there wasn't a business case to actually. For the cost for us to, to implement a digital network in a brownfield environment, it wasn't quite there. Uh, uh, it, was, it was a huge amount of cost, especially if we were going to go to a, a Tetra network, um, uh, where it was just a big bang approach. Uh, how do you keep your operations functioning and talking to each other um, while we're learning a new system? So the cost was, didn't justify the benefits. Um, moving forward with LTE, that you know, if, if they can get the standards ratified, um, that does open up a whole new area for us um, uh, because we'd have a unified, obviously, data voice network. Um, and we do. So possibly we'd be able to skip the technology. We're not sure. Um, depends on what, you know, vendors such as yourself and how you guys collaborate with um, the cellular manufacturers in the next few years to see where we're going to be. Um, we haven't made any decisions, but obviously uh, with automation coming on line, what we've noticed operationally is that there's more technical um, requirements in terms of one-on-one um, -on -one voice calling for people to diagnose faults and have more, more of a discussion where you can't tie up an open channel, obviously, for 15, 20 minutes at a time. Um, but there's still a need in an operating pit environment that everybody needs to hear what's going on as well. So it's a bit of a, a catch-22 because you don't want people having one-on-one -on -one conversations while there's a melee going on at the same time or something like that. Everybody knows to know what's, what's going on at any one, one particular time. So how do you do that? Do you just give the people that need one-on-one -on -one calling a sat phone? Is that a cheaper option than you know, rolling out a whole digital voice network across the entire Pilbara area in our mining environment? So, so we still got to go through that exercise and, and work out exactly what it is we need. Um, it's still unknown, and whether we skip a technology, what LTE is going to offer, uh, whether it's uh, you know voice over data that we can get away with for now, until um, such time there is a the standards are ratified and we do mission critical PTT over LTE. So, yeah. It's not just the standards either, is it? Like it's what the regulators. It's the regulators, ACMA, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, as well. it's, yeah. such, it's yeah. so uncertain at the moment. Uh, looking out for the next five, ten years, it's all over the place. So what do the regulators regulate when it comes to... Oh, so what, what, what services spectrum. are operating, what spectrum? There's still... It's not health and safety, it's just spectrum. Yeah. But, 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 but just going back to our company, I mean, we're, we're in a really different space to others that, you know, such as Roy Hilda building, building a greenfield site. I mean, right. that, you know, that decision, you know, from a cost perspective is a lot cheaper than what we would have to do. Yeah, a lot of existing infrastructure, transitional change costs, and then, you know, obviously mm -hmm. new capital, yeah. And, you know, and, you know, the, the equipment's not so uh, costly, it's more the supporting infrastructure. Yeah. With mill of nowhere, solar, power, you know, thermal issues and all that sort of stuff. That's, that's where the main cost comes into it. Does that voice yeah. communication extend from the path of the mine out back into the town and beyond back to the earth? No, we, we, uh, uh, well, our particular company operates um, remotely, so we've got voice communications via radio um, that go all the way to Perth and back up to the building. Um, 
gets you know from RF to IP. And that's yeah. Yeah. I've got actually a question, maybe you might call the room. When you start considering voice over, uh, say, private LTE networks, so you can make the case and voice is attractive and you control the coverage, and then you get into, often you've got partial public op um, provider coverage there yeah. that mm -hmm. never meets. But then people say, well, I only want one handset. Oh, I've got my mate. Can you make them work? So you walk into, have you got any thoughts on, because people don't want two handsets. Uh, yeah, well, we were lucky enough with our, um, the regulator gave us, uh, put us on band three, which is the same as Telstra, so we do have some possibilities there. Um, you know, there's dual SIM card phones that come out now, yeah. so we've got our own Rio SIMs. Um, so that's one way of looking at yeah. it. Um, but again, as, as Keith mentioned, it's, uh, the yeah. regulator's going to dictate exactly where people are going to head in that space. Um, I mean, obviously the telcos have a commercial interest and controlling mm -hmm. things, so... Has that been settled yet with regard to LTT frequencies? Yeah, they're still okay. sitting on the um, seven or 800 debate right now with the ACMA. Yeah, and they've paid a lot of money for their for licensing, so yeah. they'll, they'll be lobbying fairly hard for um, total control of that area. But, I mean, I think the ACMA are now realising the importance in the industrial space to ensure that the telcos don't get the entire band in that space. Um, uh, I don't think uh, the ACMA will release any of the 700 being banned for private use, but um, certainly in the higher bands, so, yeah, they, they will be at some point. That opens up a whole lot of other questions with regard to how do you replace, um, you know, you're talking about different types of power levels and costs for infrastructure for LTE over um, traditional radio, whether it be digital or otherwise. I mean, an open cut mining is all about building hills and digging holes, right. and so your your coverage environment changes on a daily basis. Yeah. And as a vendor selling uh, communications, that's one of our biggest challenges is, is our daily contact with our customers. So you now I've done the east bits now completely dead to me, um, because they've just got huge tailings. They've just dumped um, you know forty two thousand tons of of um, overburden behind the main pit wall. So you know you you continually have to. Be moving things around to do it. Without, I don't know, how easy is that with LTE infrastructure? I don't know. Yeah. Um, but moving solar trailers around and, and, and changing that type of network is it's, 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 that's not automated yet. Uh, I, I think if you're talking LTE deployment, <coughs> a successful LTE deployment in a mining environment is all about front end engineering and modelling. So mm -hmm. you have to do extensive modelling, you have to be plugged into your bulk and mine planning systems. Yeah. And you need to be looking at the mine models and Understanding the mind state in 12 months' time, in two years' time, as best you can. Yeah. And the other, the other secret for, uh, I think, anyhow, for, for a, a mining environment <coughs> is, is how you approach your modelling. So, in a CDMA environment or an LCD environment, you need to take a macro approach and use, and use clever infill so you don't have to be disturbing your fixed infrastructure. Yeah. And that requires looking ahead as far as you can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it also has quite modelling thing be, you it, it changes your cost of ownership quite dramatically depending on what your situation is. So yeah, I think it's uh, going to be a very interesting space. Yeah, so well, I mean, we, we, we have um, um, pretty much uh, monthly meetings um, with our mining planning engineering teams. Um, right. In terms of, we, we've got, you know, we've got the end of life of the mine and also we talk to the uh, short term and long, uh, medium term planners in terms of we're going to ensure that you know we don't have any of those coverage black spots. Yeah. Uh, another good thing we did, we went out to the, the telcos and asked them, you know, how do they cover, you know, a, the Olympic event, you know, in terms of, you know, um, cellular demand of major events. So you know, we looked at cell on wheel type um, technologies. Yeah. And we've implemented those, so we can actually we we, we can mobile wise we can drag around our um, uh, okay. things to. Um, for infield coverage, I mean, there's other technologies coming out, such as yeah. um, uh, uh, small cell type devices, um, so that they're fairly uh, close to being um, uh, released on, onto the market as well. So, yeah, there's, I mean, the, the good thing is that the, the telco manufacturers are actually realise there's another market uh, yeah. other than telcos now, so they're actually really heavily involved in that.
industrial space, uh, which is good for us anyway. Once you guys get out of the mine, will the train line be used a lot of you around? The, 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 the dynamics of coverage and everything, new technologies change it again, doesn't this help you? can't really help you so much out there. What, what's the on the, on the rail line? Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's actually easier. It's easier. <laughs> it's a straight line, so you know that, that, that the coverage is not going to change at all. Does the drop off, the bandwidth drop off? Well, it does. I mean, you know, you've got to... Uh, you need more infrastructure. Uh, just yeah. the propagation of RF will dictate that. But, I mean, again, it's, yeah, it's a front-up engineering case yes. in the modelling that you do. Um, Things like that, but once your rail design's done, that's it, it doesn't change. Uh, mining, I mean, you can go <coughs> a month and the whole pit environment's completely changed. Um, so that, that's always a challenge. Yeah, I think one of the real enablers for LT is that it doesn't breathe like 3G. So that would have been a, a big challenge in a rail environment. But LT stays contiguous, not in terms of the bandwidth, but in terms of the coverage. So you've got to remember, plan ahead. Yeah, you've got to remember too that being a licensed um, technology, I um, mean, power uh, can be up as opposed to Wi Fi, where it's only limited in what you can do. So, um, so LTE down the rail corridor, if everyone was on different LTE, or you will be HP, you're going to hit a road bump into Port Hedland because that mm -hmm. spectrum is right. Telstra. That's right. Uh, it could be real. Right. So you, yeah, hence the need for this <laughs> yeah, the dedicated bands for so industry. You're, 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 up against, you're up against another industry. Yeah. Yeah, and Telstra won't be as it's, um, keen to let those um, sites go, right? They'll it's something the operators are aware of. And uh, that's, that's just uh, working with the regulator, regulator understands that. So. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Australia too is going to have a big challenge, and the regulators will have a challenge too, because I mean, at the end of the day, we're dictated to by the rest of the world. I mean, we're only a very small market in terms of the global side of things in that space. So 400 meg LTE is, overseas is, is, is going to be big. So, um, and that's, that's going to offer a lot more um, efficiencies in terms of how much infrastructure you roll out for, for any industry sort of thing. So. Devices will be plentiful on the right bands. Yeah, I mean, I don't need to have, you know, well, the company doesn't need, you know, 300 meg or, or 200 meg, you know, to run it. Yeah. So, you know, 400 meg would be a great frequency. You, you know, you probably Good propagation. You get 30, 30 your costs. Yeah, it's a great footprint, isn't it? So yeah. <laughs> we did it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a little while away. Yeah. That's where the interest is. 700 is not going to be available for quite some time. Yeah, FirstNet um, in the U.S. will certainly drive the <coughs> 700 debate here. We've been we've been uh, using 800 meg and deploying it. We just deployed it down at a utility customer uh, recently, just so we can understand the propagation models, the use cases, the challenges. Um, and 800 is reasonable. It's kind of in the middle. It's got a fair amount of availability because one of the big carriers in the U.S. has devices available for it. One point I think we're wrong. One point is. You have a little bit more infrastructure, but if you model it correctly, um, it's fine. Yeah. It's just fine. A, I think yeah. when you step up to 2.2 and go higher, then you start to really. Yeah. Um, just, just it, just it, it also comes down to what your applications are. Because remember, at the end of the day, it's if you're looking for throughput, you want small cells. Yeah. So you don't care whether it's 1.8 or 800 or 400. Right. If you're looking at rail, for example, and you're just looking at um, management messaging, great, yeah, 400 makes great. But if you want to go into the pit and you've got six cameras per vehicle and you've got all your LiDAR data coming back and you've got huge amounts of capacity, you need lots of cells. That's, That's physics right. at the end of the day. So then, then the, the actual frequency choice, you're not driven to the lower band. It's not a big issue. The, really, the real critical driver is understanding your, your bandwidth modelling um, uh, across the value chain. Understanding how that modeling fits in with the, with the performance requirements for the applications. Yeah. I think it's really, uh, where your uplink constraints are, it's all about what your uplink constraints are. That's right. and and I, and I think we'll see a lot of um, additionally in this space. So we've got the licensed spectrum, we've also got the unlicensed spectrum, and we're seeing developments in that space where you'll see LTE running over unlicensed. Um, you'll see the benefits of using both licensed and unlicensed um, 
And I think, especially if we start to go into certain areas within the mine site, where you might go into a factory, into a workshop, um, you want high video, high speed video, you should be using Wi Fi. It makes a lot of sense, got the devices there. So I think it's going to hit there. And I think that from a technology perspective, there's going to be lots of op options open to enterprises yeah. uh, in the future, both licensed and unlicensed. Yeah. And I think that the telcos, I think, are reasonably keen to play the game. It's just what game they, they want to be in it. But uh, you know, I, I, we know that you know, we work quite closely with them. You know, they see this. I know that you guys spoke to them initially at the beginning, um, but you know, they are very keen to... to Differentiate assist. their services yeah. and, and frequency yeah. as well. Yeah. And, yeah. They, and I think they see the customers in this space as very important and very valuable, but they have to come and play the game as well. Tom, how do you define unlicensed? Well, there's 600 megahertz of unlicensed at 2.45 uh, and then higher. So there's a lot of spectrum there that's available. It's an ISM band, though, so you have no more right to it than anyone else. And there are power limits, as Mike said. So great for hotspot, right? Not yeah. fantastic when you want to cover large areas. Because okay. yeah. there's a lot, lot of, um, well, there's some deployment happening at the moment in sort of pseudo unlicensed, I'd call it, 2100 uh, space. Where the carriers aren't using it, um, some operators are sort of jumping in there. I was just wondering if you're referring to that. Well, no, I mean, we've done a lot of work with operators overseas where they will have the, the TDD spectrum, so the unpaired spectrum, and they look to utilise it. And they're very, very keen then to look at where they could provide that. So rather than utilising their, their high value spectrum, which they're using for consumers, um, they're looking at how can they build, go to market on these. Um, TDD or specialised frequencies, 2.6 or other yep. examples like that. The key requirement then becomes the handset, right? yep. the equipment, right? because if you're not going to have that volume, um, you know, but then if we go into the embedded environment with the, the chipsets, you might not get it in a phone, mm -hmm. but you might get it in a Sierra wireless or Alta or some of the chipset. Some of the automation use cases that could be enabled with Correct. that. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And unlicensed obviously isn't as much of a concern, or maybe, maybe it is. Is it a concern in a open pit mine that's miles away from everybody else. Yeah, look, it's a good question, I think, and they run it today. All right, so the mining companies yeah. run unlicensed today, and their autonomy, you know, we're fully aware of auto full autonomy, vehicle autonomy running across. Unlicensed. Uh, wireless, yeah. uh, unlicensed. You know, but then there is always, you know, we had the example, I think, here, where we, we saw some rail operators looking to use Wi-Fi for train signaling uh, in a heavy, heavy populated area, mm -hmm. it stopped. Right. And they have no right to it. As we saw with the FCC, if anyone saw the announcement a couple of weeks ago, um, one of the hotel chains lost, uh, they were fined because they were blocking people from using unlicensed spectrum. And you can do it, right? You can send disconnects to all the devices. You're not allowed to do that in the ISM band. So there's limits to what you can do if you're going to run in an unlicensed. But it works really well, right? So I think it's the head net is the right answer, using both. Um, use Picking it for the right application correct. and, and driving right. yeah, the right understanding. But obviously, well, security is not an issue. It doesn't matter what the thing, whether it's mining, oil, or gas, but it just depends on the type of service and criticality of the business. Yeah. If, you, if you've got a mission critical application, autonomy, for example, um, then um, you, you classify accordingly and you, you risk management accordingly so you don't transport it on a technology that. Um, to their risk. Right. Yeah. And in the future, so when we look at this assisted access or LTU, they're looking at converged schedulers where you're going to make intelligent choices of using both sets of frequencies. So the radio will be going, how heavily utilise that particular spectrum, I'll use that. Right. I think that's where we're going. We're a little bit, you know, 5G is where we'll get to. We're not quite there yet, but um, I think you'll be digging iron ore out of the ground for a little while. <laughs> so we've got about a little bit of time. Yeah. I suppose the other thing, is just an example on unlicensed, so um, we have a reclaimer stacker and normally they run off an optical reel, the update coupler, um, track something down, um, you know, it's a single point of failure, especially the optic, op optical coupler, I mean that, that's a massive production, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, it needs to be run 100% of the time. Uh, now but normally they'll back it up with a Wi-Fi point-to-point link. There's two things to that. I mean, if that reclaimer had to shut down because, you know, there was something critical that happened that put someone's 
personal safety, you need to make sure that you know, that resiliency is going to shut down. It's not going to be interfered by something else that someone's put up next to something. Right. So, you know, it's that lack of control that you have mm-hmm. over that Wi-Fi space that becomes critical. You know, you're just talking about normal corporate stuff and, you know, it doesn't matter. But yeah. once you start running, you know, autonomous trucks and things like that. Got to have resiliency or yeah. license spectrum yeah. Yeah. built into the system. Yeah, yeah. that inter- interference is the difference between, you know, a live vehicle getting squashed and right. not getting squashed. So, yeah. So you need to be very careful in terms of um, your selection matrix in terms of what, what sort of uh, uh, technology you're going to use in that space. Certainly more choices than uh, we'll ever have. I mean, in the next next few years with these standards like the a- aggregation that you were just talking about, Tom, of the frequencies, that will open up a lot of different possibilities. Yeah. Well, it's a great stopping point, I think, for lunch. Um, we're just a few minutes over. Why don't we go out, have a bite to eat, and... Uh, We'll come back in one o'clock and continue the conversations. Can 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 continue the conversations.